Mm-hmm. Press play on the box. Press play on the box. My name is Russell Shokes III. I'm the son of Russell Maroon Shokes, who's a political prisoner out of Philadelphia. My dad was incarcerated because him and his comrades went down to shoot a a police officer. There was an Amadou Diallo style shooting where Cat was young and he was joyriding a car and, and he ran in the back of his mom's alley kitchen and the cops shot him in front of his mom. And so the whole neighborhood was outraged and they went to retaliate. But it went retaliating being uh, part of the Black Panther Party, being part of the BLA, Black Liberation Army? Actually, this was prior to them merging oh, really? with them and they okay. had a they had a small organization So what called, year was this? This was, uh, I would say, probably 68 or something okay. like that or 69, something like that. Right, and so was he arrested immediately or? No, no, he wasn't. Uh, At some point, he went on the run for two years. Okay. As his comrades were caught on the scene almost. Right. And he was on a run for two years and went to New York and lived in the underground in New York for two years. Right, and so when did he get, when and how did he get caught? I, mean, I guess he got caught 1970? 70, 71. Okay. And uh, where, where, was he caught here in Philadelphia or was he? He was caught here in Philadelphia. Um, he was making trips back and forth to see his family. Okay. His moms, his aunts, his sisters, you know. How did he become politicized? How did he become, I mean, was he always? He was politicized through the actual actions in the city through Rizzo, through the little boy being shot, through uh, people coming at him and saying, we need to do something. So it's almost, it's, we're gang, we're gangbangers, you know. Okay. So, yeah, so the, the community is being, you know. Right. Because the, the gang situation in those days was more um, territorial. Gangs protected communities. Yes, yes, yes. So it was and this like, guy lived in the community. He so lived he right was, around the corner. He so was, it was part like of that. the. We knew him. Right. We didn't. Know, my dad knew him. Right. And so, they felt compelled. They were politicized through, through through the bathing. Right. Of the, <laughs> by know, living it. Yeah, by living it. And they they formed organizations. Black Unity Council, Buck, an organization. One of the first organizations that him and my aunts were involved in was called the Black Unity Council or the Buck. Right. And the Buck merged with the Black Panther Party. And actually the Black Panther Party recognized the Buck as as really militant. Right. And and they sought them out as a part of their military wing. So so your dad really So this action was more of a of a a politicized gang action in the in the terms of gangs not in terms of like the Black Liberation Army or the Black Panther Party or any other uh, uh, right military or sure. militant actions. Yes, and a lot of that came after the fact. Right. Wow. Yeah, That's they heavy. were. Yeah, they were already organized in a certain type of way, and they were already they were already being terrorized in the community. Right. And they were figuring ways to try to deal with that. Right. It's because there was no other options. The, yeah. The, the police were, I mean, it was Rizzo time. And, yeah. you know, it wasn't just because you were still in a car and joyriding. You're just getting bopped upside the head just right. Just because. Yeah. It's, not, so it, it's, like, um, it's like when uh, um, that famous essay that um, uh, Amiri Baraka wrote about bebop. That bebop, the strength and the, and, the, and the energy of bebop came from being knocked upside the head. Right. Right. By cops right. and by the system. Right. You know what I mean? It was beep, bop. Right. You know? Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In a totally. lot of ways, that was that was your dad. That was my dad totally in the context of they were just trying to drink wine and sing on the corners, but getting beat for it. Right. You know, and it was commonplace for the cops to throw you in the back of the paddy wagon 
and beat you and drive around town and let you out on the other side gang territory. That was common. And, and let you catch a beating over and there. And let you catch a beating over there. My mom and dad met um, with my, they were young. Um, in the context of just coming out of their late teens, early 20s. My mother moved up from Virginia. My dad already lived here. He's walking down the street. He sees her on Pine Street. He thinks she's beautiful. He, he puts his moves on. Um, at this point, he's not so politicized at all. You know, they have kind of the perfect life in the context of after they got married. He had two jobs. They had to pick a fence. They had two cars. You know, they had a perfect kind of family life, you know. Right. And so uh, my dad had got out of the gang warren and I got out of, you know, uh, hanging on the streets and drinking wine on the corners and had committed himself to being a family man. And uh, after he met your mom, after he met my mom and then uh, he become he becomes more politicized as the situation gets worse and worse and worse. Right. So. Um when does all that change? When does when does the family life kind of thing? When does that all change? Because your dad goes underground. So what? In the sixty eight. My dad goes underground actually in seventy one. Okay. In seventy one, um, between seventy one and seventy. Does he get? But doesn't he get arrested for the for the uh, the thing in Philly? He gets arrested for the uh, he gets arrested for the shooting of the police officer in seventy one after the uh, the shooting, but he had went on the run for two years. Okay, he had went on a run after that. So the whole time years. that he's on the run, is he um, is he politicized? Right. Yes. 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 He is politicized at that point. He had knew my mom for some years now. Um, they had dated, they had had children, so they had children, so they had to get married. It was one of those situations. Right. They were young. They had, he had his first kid, Teresa, my, my sister. So they immediately got married. You know, um, they didn't know each other really that well at that point of my daughter. I mean, they knew each other, but not in the context of a long-term relationship. It was one of those classic back in the day, right. I got you pregnant, we got to get married. And they were and then, growing from And then that he point. goes through this transformation, this and political then he, transformation. Right, and then he started... Shortly after that. Shortly after that, he's going through this political transformation. Um, he's still trying to, here and there, go and hang out with the boys after he had the baby and take a little sip, sing a little bit, do wop a little bit, and then try to go back and be family man and do jobs. And So that was a whole dichotomy for him, trying to be the family man and trying to still hang out with the boys and still be a regular person and sing and shoot the shit and, you know, and do wop. Right. And drink some wine. And at the same time that all this is happening, he's, he's putting his life in a, into a political context. Yes, he's finding out that there is um, some politics in everything you do, life-wise. That's right. what he's kind of figuring out, that uh, even though we're just fresh out of, you know, doo-wopping and, and gang-warring, and even now and then, because I'm young and I just had a baby, or what have you, and I'm trying to change my life, if my man calls me and they're fighting, then I got to go and fight right. with them, even though I really don't want to, but I have to go fight with them. Right. So it was those type of situations. It's residual. Yes, very residual and very touch and go. Right. You know. Because it's not, it, the things haven't completely it changed. It wasn't an absolute for sure. But it's also um, the, the, the paradigm hasn't changed. You no, know? no. It's still. Cops are still coming around. It's still oops folks. upside your head. Yeah. You know, um, it's still watch your back late night in the street. It's still you get thrown in the paddy wagon and left in the wrong neighborhood. Right. It's still, you know, they'll beat you in the paddy wagon, you know. So how many brothers and sisters do you have? I have seven brothers and sisters, four by my mother and three by Sister Love, who is my dad's. Uh, love interest in the political context. As my mother was apolitical and not interested in the Panthers, Buck, or BLA, or any organization like that, but really interested in her family and raising her family and being a, a, a housewife and a mother to her kids, which 
was losing interest rapidly with my dad because my father was becoming more politicized and looking for a woman who would be interested in those things. And Sister Love uh, fit that mold perfectly for where, him. Where was, where did, how did Sister Love become? Well, Sister Love actually was a friend of my aunt's who were politicized. My aunt Saida, my aunt Sue, they experienced a lot of what my dad had experienced. And so... Um, they all kind of became politicized together. Okay. And when my father uh, would, would come home and tell stories about them gang warring or about the cops doing whatever they did, his sisters would obviously be compassionate, so forth and so on. And, and they would put it in a political context, I'm, I'm imagining. Sure, sure. My Aunt Saida was very good at putting things in a political context. And my Aunt Sue was on her way to Cheney, you know, college and things like that. And so it was just kind of a natural progression in the context of young people, you know, getting older. So there's this really, um, there's this huge divide um, at this point in time for your dad between the old life and the life that he's sort Embarking of on. stepping into. Sure, there was a huge divide in that lifestyle. And it was very rough because my mother's not, you know, Whistling Dixie, she's, she's a tough customer and she's not just going to allow you to have these children <laughs> and then, for lack of better terms, cut out. Not that my father was even trying to cut out, right. you know, but he definitely had a dilemma in the context of there are some people in our neighborhood who care about the neighborhood enough to kind of stand up for it. And I'm a corner boy and I always cared about the neighborhood, you know, and so I'm going to stand up for my neighborhood too, even though I'm removed from it, having kids and continuing to have kids, like stair-step kids, like one this year, one next year, one maybe a year and a half after that one. And this is interesting too, in the context of uh, sister Love and his sisters and other people, women specifically, in the context of women, I want to say that my dad says too that a lot of times in the movement, a big mistake that they made, my dad will say this to anyone and has said it to me many times, is that they just didn't listen to the women. And if they would have listened, then maybe they would be in a different position. That, that intuition. And, right. That, that <laughs> sixth sense right. that women have, um, my dad... And his comrades were moving around from New York here to there, and they were back here in Philly to do some expropriations or some bank robberies or to get food for the community because they would rob food trucks and they would rob banks and they would give people sustenance, you know, things right. that they could survive on until Robin the Hood. next time. Right. They would do the Robin Hood. Robin, thing. Robin would, for the hood. Robin for the hood. They would rob for the hood. Um, and they would come back and give people money, give them food, and they would be off again. So my dad was coming here with uh, some Panthers from New York and a couple from here, and Mark Holder is one, and they did a bank robbery here, and they got caught. And they, oh, you're Russell Shokes. Oh, yeah, great. We got you now. <laughs> right. We've been looking for So we got you on the robbery. We got you on this murder of this police officer. Right. Right. And so it's 1971, and how does the trial go? Oh, it's a slam dunk for for the DA and you know in the state because. And what is what what stance does your does your father take a, a a political stance in the trial or does he? I don't I don't think he took a political stance in the context of uh, sort of like like this some people took line. right some people took a a, a prisoner of a war stance line. right. right. Where they would not participate in the trial, and not recognize the United States government, that whole thing. So I was just no. Curious. He didn't do it that context, but what they did do was, they, for lack of better terms, made an oath to each other that they wouldn't tell on each other. So right. to this day, no one knows who the shooter is in the Philly Five case. That's the Philly Five case. Right. You have five people doing life for the murder of one person, when obviously they all couldn't put their hand on the trigger and right. do the five in one killing. And so someone shot the police officer, but till this day, no one knows who right. shot the police officer. Right. You know, and I've asked my dad repeatedly, and you know, but you know, it won't give up. He's not saying who the shooter is, and because of his actions, because of his escapes, because of so forth and so on, they've made him 
the ring leader, the mastermind. Right. It only could have been you really. He needs to be the example. Exactly. He is the example for the Philly Five, even and though. for anyone else who's thinking about. Even though, in defense of the Philly Five, all of them have been made offers to either tell on each other or tell on my dad and escape moments or wherever it be to, to get free or to, to have their freedom. But in, in, in defense of them, they've never said anything. They had perfect opportunity to say, yeah, it was Russell or yeah, it was Freddie Burton or yeah, it was whoever. But they never did that. None that's, of them. That's an incredible um, example of loyalty. Yes. And so my dad is doing you know, double life plus a whole bunch of years with the escapes and all of that. But his comrades are doing a flat life bid and really all they need to do is point a finger and they could get out of it at any given moment, kind of, sort of. But they're doing, they're, they're holding on. The only thing that's stopping them from getting out of prison is saying, that guy's a trigger guy, actually. And so it's five people just doing time for... For one. For, for one person, whoever that person is. Right. My dad escaped officially two times. And the third time? The third time is unofficial. <laughs> and, and, and there's probably... Uh, unofficial in, in, in what sense? In that it's not recognized as being an escape? Or... In, 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 in the context of, uh, especially in those younger years, there were multiple, multiple attempts. They were always trying to liberate themselves. I think there was uh, some type of code or oath or... Uh, just like they made to themselves to try to free themselves also. Okay. And so he was constantly trying to free himself. But he, so he escapes twice officially. Officially to where he actually got beyond the prison wall, where no one snitched, where uh, the guards didn't figure out that he had some type of tool or a blade right. or something to get out with, or that the, there was some cement being punched from his cell or whatever and switched cells or whatever it may be, but officially he only escaped twice. He was out the first time for close to a month, which was him, for lack of better terms, living off the land in rural Pennsylvania as the prison is out in the middle of nowhere and up against the odds of, you know, the FBI, the state troopers, the local police, the local community. Because in those days and times, they would call out the community, and they do nowadays too, just in a different way, like keep your eyes open, blah, blah, blah. Right. But it would be like you could have your shotgun and you could go black man hunting. So he gets caught and sent back? He gets caught after that month out and basically was a situation of uh, the community movement not being in a position to uh, be there uh, transportation or otherwise for a person who liberated themselves. Right. Okay. The second time was actually planned through him entering himself into a psych ward as a lower security base. So basically, he played crazy. They sent him to the crazy hospital. He got a visit from uh, a woman who was in the movement and that woman smuggled in a submachine gun and a handgun. And she gave that submachine gun and handgun to my dad and his comrades and they liberated themselves. Two days later, they were in a gunfight with, you know, state troopers, FBI, you know. And because she really wasn't, it was winter time too. And she really wasn't prepared in the context for frostbite and things of that sort and she was starting to get that and so they were negotiating what do we do now mm -hmm. you know because we can't go on because she can't make it and it was just rough and actually uh uh i believe lamumba fudge was killed in that in that uh escape and so uh, how many people escaped him and two other people and one of them were killed okay and so he got charges from that, too, after that, you know, obviously. You know. Right. When you were growing up, uh, what was it like not having your dad around? Oh, it was, it was extremely rough for me. I was young. I was black. I was growing up in the hood. Um, I was very keen to the fact that people didn't have fathers. 
and not just me. And so I kind of melted into that pot of the fatherless pot. And I became very disgruntled and angry about it and very angry at him. And he would send me letters. I would ball him up and play basketball with him and shoot him in a trash can. Or, you know, I would just, my aunts and uncles would take me up to the prison to see him as a little guy. And I would just be kind of lackadaisical or what have you. And I didn't care to really know the story at some points. You know, I cared to know the story later on. Uh, as I became a young adult, a young teenage adult. But uh, as a young teenager and, and as a young kid, I could really care less about the Panthers. I, I didn't understand the Panthers. I didn't understand uh, the BLA or, or movement or movement issues or anything like that. And I really didn't care, you know. And a very minute part of me, that child in me, still doesn't care. You know, and so our relationship, even till this day, um, is one of deep, deep love for each other. But he also knows that that part of me uh, misses having a dad, you know. And um, so everybody knew who your dad was? Everyone knew who my dad was. Growing up when you were a growing kid? Growing up when I was a kid. He was on the front of newspapers. Uh, there were... How was that for you when you were growing up and your sisters and whatnot? It was pretty rough for me um, and my sisters also, but uh, there would be situations where, you know, kids would say, when's your dad going to break out again so we can have a day off from school? You know, that's cool. Da, 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 those type of situations. Uh, teachers would give me a little extra hug and are you all right? And uh, spend more time with me and do a little more with me as a kid and and i wouldn't recognize until i got older that those things were directly connected to you know my father right and then um how was your mother handling all this my mother wasn't handling it good at all in the context of you know your husband flipped the script on you for the, for the most part he was the great milkman and steel worker at a steel plant bringing home big checks. You guys had two cars and a picket fence. And then at some point there was this jagged edge where, you know, you start finding guns and literature and, and, and as a sixth sense probably of a woman suspecting that he's with another woman because of that sixth sense of a woman or just like you're not here enough or those type of things. And uh, just at some point probably really coming to grips with the facts that I'm losing my husband, you know, to the movement or to the streets. I grew up the youngest in my household because I only recognized that there were three of us um, growing up. But uh, the story is, is that uh, my mother's girlfriend in the, in the heat of all that we're speaking of in the heat of my father being incarcerated in the heat of uh, him and my mother separating. Uh, my mother went to Virginia for refuge and one of her best girlfriends said, hey, let me help you with the infant baby that you have um, because you're struggling too hard. You can't take care of four kids by yourself. And while you're here in Virginia, I'll just help you with her. So she did. And then at some moment just disappeared with the baby. And everyone tried to find her and look for her but she was gone. So this, so your mom's best friend essentially kidnapped her daughter. My mom's best friend kidnapped my little sister. At, while well, she's at an infant. infant. At infant age. Um, my mother was distraught about it. It's still distraught to this day about it. Doesn't like to talk about it because it's, it's not something that you really want to dialogue about. Right. It's very extremely painful and unexpected from a quote unquote friend. Um, but it's what happened. And so we would spend a lot of summers in Virginia and my mother would spend a lot of time looking for our sister, which we didn't really analyze and really understand those trips to Virginia until we were older, you know, but, uh, at some point my cousin, who's a good friend of mine and we are just really tight. Uh, would ask me to come to Virginia and hang out with her. And we would hang out and party. We were young adults. 
And at some point, she said, it's this woman who looks just like your mom and Teresa. And so I thought nothing of it. And I went to go hang out with her one time. And this girlfriend of hers came to hang out. And when I saw her, I almost immediately eerily knew that she was my sister. But how? Because I only have two sisters and I never knew about a third sister. And she would be younger than me and so forth and so on. So it was kind of weird, but it somehow got through the grapevine internally in the family also with the aunts and grandma that the baby that got stolen is an adult now and here. And we need to deal with that. And so my mother went down with her sisters and they dealt with that on the lawn of the lady who had stole the baby. They found her, found out where she was living, and they went there to confront her physically about stealing my mother's youngest child. Were, was she ever brought up on charges or anything? No, she wasn't. They didn't go to court and all of that. They didn't just handle it. They didn't handle it that way. They handled level. it community. Right. Community way. Right. Nevertheless, obviously my mom and my sister were strained. Right. And uh, very tense meetings followed afterwards, basically with uh, the family saying, that's not your mother, you know, and her knowing and explaining to her cousins at some point that, yeah, there are some strange things that have been going on, and I have been trying to get my birth certificate for a really long time, and I'm in the service now, and so forth and so on. I've been to Germany here, there, and there, so I'm kind of moving around outside of Virginia, but um, there are some strange going-ons that make me wonder if what you guys are saying is actually true, because... I grew up with this lady. I grew up knowing this lady to be my mother. Right. But she treats me differently than she treats other, her other children biologically. And so after a while, it actually sank into her that we are your family. We're your family. You know? And so her actually being able to uh, go through that brought her to a point to where at some point she wanted to know who her father was and meet her father. The whole time that this is going on with your, your mom and your family and your sister, your dad's in prison. My dad's in prison. He's also not aware of all of the on? ongoings and reference to the new development and so forth. And a lot of it doesn't get conveyed to him in the context of... Does he know that she's not with you guys? Yes. Yes, he does. And he never conveys that in the time that you are are no. visiting no. in the interim. No. And and in a lot of ways, you know, he just endures a lot in that context and kind of kind of just keeps it keeps lit on it. Yeah, you know. It's wow. it's not something to delve into with my kids, I guess. So he has this um he has this weight or this responsibility that, of, that he's chosen politically, and then he's got this weight that he hasn't chosen. Right. Outside personally. of... Personally. Yeah, personally. You know what I mean? I mean, there's a... So there's like a political cost, which um, is its own preparation, I suppose. I mean, I, I'm, I'm imagining that the whole time that he's underground and He's got guns and so on and so forth, and they're doing appropriation, you know, expropriations and feeding the community and, you know, all of this other stuff. There's a chance I'm going to get caught, I'm going to go to prison. But right. that's my politics. Right. That's right. the situation I'm living in. Right. This whole other bag with the family thing, you, there, there's not even a way that you could possibly imagine that. No, there's, again, I didn't know it until my cousin came and said, there's somebody who looks like you. It looks like your sister. It looks like aunt, you know, auntie. And I just thought that was weird or whatever. But then when I saw her as my sister, and I saw her not as my sister, as this girl who we're just going to hang out and have a drink with, I'm like, that's my sister. Like, 
whether I want her to be my sister or not, and that might even be crazy, and I grew up being the youngest out of the family, and I knew I was the youngest. I'm the last baby that I was had or whatever, because my mom didn't have this conversation of, you know, my girlfriend stole your little sister, so you're not the youngest. Really, is there some young kid out there somewhere 30 years later, because when we find her, she's close to 30, you know, and so she's lived an entire life devoid of us, so it actually takes a, a adjustment period for her to even really even wrap her head around it. Right. For everybody. For everyone. You know. And, the, and but the but the but this is something that your dad can't see. At all. This is you know, at this all. is blindsided. At all. Totally and so, blindsided. And when he really sees it, I mean he knows that we're gone, that we found her or whatever, but when he really sees it, it's years later when she musters the courage to go and meet this guy who's a political prisoner who she's heard all this stuff about. She don't know. She's kind of a little scared. She's actually worked as a prison guard before, you know. And so she's really kind of feeling it out. And uh, the tension grew even tighter at some point when she questioned, legitimately questioned, her biological parents. Like, is he really my dad? All this other stuff happened. Right. Right. You know, I could be anybody's kid, really. Right. Okay, now I figure out that she's not my mom. Right. But are you really my mom? Are you really my dad? You know, those type of, which are tough questions and hard questions for my dad and mom to have actually to, right. have to answer as the real parents of this kid who are responsible for the fact that she ended up with this lady. Right. Not just my mom, but my dad, too. Right. He's just as responsible as my mom is. So how long how how long how how long has your father been in prison when this all comes about? Oh. As long as as long as I'm alive, 30 years or more. So he's in prison for 30 years when he finds out that his daughter, his youngest daughter has been found and wants to see him and confirm that he's her father. It's literally almost like your past coming back to haunt you. Definitely. Definitely for my mother and my father. Yeah. And I felt for both of them in that context because I have a daughter. And it would be unexplainable at some point, obviously, that, you know, someone stole you. You know, that's, that's the answer. The answer is, is that we trusted someone and they stole you. That is the answer. And that person has been masquerading around as your mother. But that's not your mother. I'm your mother and that's your father. You know, and those people are just kidnappers, basically, at the end of the day. And so those conversations weren't easy at all. And in defense of my sister, till this day, she still needs more of those conversations. Because to say that one time right. is, is never enough, kind of, sort of. Right. You know, but again... It's extremely stressful and extremely painful for my mother, and she literally refuses to keep having that conversation over and over and over again. Although we understand that my sister needs that conversation, you know. And so um, a lot of times it's just a lot of us sisters and brothers dialoguing, dialoguing with her, you know, for lack of better terms, nurturing her, loving her bringing her up to speed, introducing her to more family, so forth and so on. At, at adult age, at full-on adult age, you know. And she has a daughter, my niece Ashley, so forth and so on. So even those relationships... So now, now it just gets exponentially it gets It gets... It's so complicated. So my father sees my daughter, who's his granddaughter, but hasn't seen... His other granddaughter. His other granddaughter, who's a grown woman now. And just met his daughter, who is her mother. So the granddaughter wow. is a whole nother question. And this is and so this is not something that one can prepare for uh when you when you go to make the decisions that, that one makes when 
when they go through that political metamorphosis that your father did to say, I'm going to go toe-to-toe with the system. Right. Because uh, I don't see another way of resolving this, not for myself, but for, you know, everyone who's been oppressed or downtrodden. Mm. This is the way out for us. Right. And so it's kind of it's kind of um a heavy thing to deal with cuz you don't it's almost like you're not you don't have all the information in front of you when you make those decisions when you made a decision 30 40 years ago 40 years ago to 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 do certain things this wasn't it it, it never was part of the deal for my father or my mother you know, and my mother, you know, bless her soul. Or your sister, or, or for you guys, right. or anybody. A grandmother, anybody, you know. And and uh, we all have, you know, been wounded, you know, in that context. Uh, and and obviously, my sister bears some of the some of the deeper wounds in the context of now at thirty plus sitting through trying to figure, okay, okay, I know you guys said that's what happened, but now I have to actually integrate that into my life. Oh, I'm a Shokes. Oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, uh, oh, it's a family reunion. Oh, I have to meet everybody. Oh, they all know that I'm that kid that got took, got stolen or what have you. Oh, people are tense with me. You know, people are afraid of me. People, you know, uh, I got to build a relationship with my father. What's that like? Oh, I miss my dad. Oh, my this guy. My father who's in prison. My father who's this. Oh, he's, he has superstar status. Oh. Oh, well, whoop de do. How do I fit into that? Who am I? You know, I used to be a prison guard. You know, I'm in the military. You know, all of those questions, you know, and just a lot. To swallow. Well, it, well, especially because she was in the military, she was a prison guard. It throws her whole life into question. Sure. With her, with her dad, sure. more so than you know anybody else. Yes, and 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 especially in the context of um, working and dealing with the state for long periods of time, and and feeling that the state is a part of you and help nurture you. And the state was actually an escape from this woman who I knew really wasn't my mother. And the way I could really get out of this kind of weird, biased situation was to join the service early on how and make you, a career out of what it. Was it. What was your dad's reaction to all that? Oh, my dad's reaction is always the same reaction is that he was very compassionate towards her. He was very open and very much feeling responsible. Um, but at the same time saying, you know, I'm here, obviously. <laughs> like, I ain't going nowhere, you know, but uh, I'm not refusing you or I know you are my child and I know that it may be tough for you to swallow but when you can swallow it, swallow it, you know, but we're here for you. I love you. It's almost as if, you know, it's hard for me to understand how much of a Herculean effort it must take for him to sort of keep it together and keep his, his ideals intact in the face of being in prison, in the face of his family being torn apart in the face of, you know, um, the contradictions that have arisen because of that. In other words, the state kind of saves his daughter in, in a, in a, in a, on a certain level, mm -hmm. in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, it, it must take a Herculean effort to keep your, to keep yourself intact. Never mind. Just yourself, but not just not just yourself, but also your politics to keep your politics intact. Sure. Well, like I said before, I think at any given time, any of the Philadelphia Five, you know, including my dad, have probably had moments where 
anyone else could have just said, you know, forget this, you know, loyalty crap, forget this, you know, no snitch policy or whatever you want to think of it as. But, you know, I need to just say that somebody else did it and I can walk or get less time or be out of this situation in a short amount of time in order to go and be with my family or deal with my situation or, you know. And that temptation must have arisen when this whole thing with your sister popped up. Oh, just at one point for sure, for sure. Definitely, you had to. I mean, you're, you know, in a lot of ways, I would imagine that if you were a political prisoner who was in prison serving time, that, you know, that your, your test would be just to serve your time. And it, it seems like when in your dad's case, it's, it's a never-ending battle. Yeah, I, I, I feel like, just in, you know, losing his daughter, all of that, his fortitude is, you know, uh, along with my mom's, you know, fortitude is really, really strong and sound because I know in different points of it, I've broken down, you know, um, so I can only imagine as the parents, and I'm a parent now, and I just really can't even imagine that. I can't imagine any of it, really, in reference to my daughter. You know, I just can't really even, I don't know if I can make it through, tell you honestly. I'm just being honest with you. I don't know if I can make it under those, I guess I would have to make it, but it would be, it would be. It's not something you need to look forward to. <laughs> oh, oh, it would be, it would be very strenuous and it'd be stressful. It would be really, really stressful, you know, losing your kid to someone who you trust, to someone who you, you know. It's like, it would be like you taking my daughter, you know? It would be like my best friend taking my daughter, stealing my daughter. I would be out of my wits. It, would, it might almost drive me cuckoo. You know, I might lose it, you know? Right, and so in a lot of ways, you know, uh, you, you mentioned that your, your, both your parents had this fortitude because your mom didn't ask for this. You your, know, your, your, dad, I, your dad didn't ask for it either, but he walked into it on a certain level, of his own accord. Uh, of his own accord, and having some expectations of right of possible what, what situation scenarios. Right. My mom just kind of plopped in her lap, you know, like, you know, and having to sort through and deal and struggle with it, even the interrogations and the, you know, the door kick-ins and the, you know, the people at work, because she actually, I went to the school, and she worked at the school. So... You know, it would be her bosses and her colleagues and other teachers who would be like, oh, your husband escaped from prison or blah, 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 or whatever. I can only imagine those conversations. I was a kid, but I know those conversations took place just by the way the teachers treated me. So I know, you know, in the teacher's lunchroom, you know, it was, oh, my God, Mrs. Schultz, you know, I don't know how you do it, blah, blah, blah. And I can only imagine my mom's answers, you know, and, you know. It just was not an easy situation personally, you know. And I can only imagine, you know, my mom's situation throughout work and her everyday life, you know. And so uh, do you think your, your dad um, regrets um, the life that he chose? Uh, that's a good question, but I doubt it. I doubt it at all. Um, even after the price that he's paid. Yeah, even after. Even after the price. Never mind. Let me rephrase that. The he's price paying. he's continuing to pay. Yes. Um, yes. And it seems sometimes, especially with my sister, that, you know, after 30 years, you know, and someone who's your daughter full-grown woman, you know, you're just meeting her or what have you, you know, comes up to visit you in prison, and you've been in prison already her whole lifetime, pretty much, and now you're starting a relationship with her, like, like you just met somebody. Not like you just met somebody. You just met this person. But this is your biological, you know, daughter, and this is the starting point. You have to start from here. You don't get anything else, you know, and... And you have to attribute some of that to yourself, a great part of it to yourself. And she's in pain. 
she's in a great deal of pain. And you have to attribute that, you know, a great portion of that to yourself. You know, and so in those contexts, I know it's not easy for my dad. And, and kudos to him in the context of being patient with her, being willing to answer her questions, you know, being willing to be, uh, for lack of better terms, uh, grilled, you know, over the charcoals about what, how, when, where, and why. Um, and so, yeah, she's a... Uh, and your dad's, your dad's in a, a special unit in prison. Yes, yes. My dad is in a restricted housing unit, State Correctional Institute at Green. And Green, State Correctional Institute at Green was built specifically to house and to uh, be a control unit for the state. And when I say a control unit, I mean people who are on lockdown 21 hours a day. You know, they get to exercise in a dog cage for one hour and they get a shower every three days. You know, and so that type of situation scenario generally renders people insane. You know, so he's lucky to be able to even have the conversation now with her after spending over 15, 20 years in solitary confinement. Is that he's so he's been in solitary for that long for 20 years? Well, well, well. When did they build the the shoe? They built it, I believe, in the nineties. That's right. They built it in the nineties. So he's probably he's you know so it's twenty twenty some odd years that he's been in in solitary, solitary. confinement. Yeah, and I mean, you, well, so after, when you visit him, can after, you visit him? Do you are you sitting in the same room? No, no, we visit in a non-contact cage with uh, plexiglass in between. Um, and when you visit, it's for an hour, unless you get an extended visit, and then that's four hours, and that's the most you can extend. And uh, it's an SCI, Green State Correctional Institute in Green County. Green is the most southern county, southwestern county in Pennsylvania. So you drive out towards Pittsburgh, then you go south about 60, 70 miles as if you were going to West Virginia. And right before you hit the West Virginia border is State Correctional Institute at Green. And so, so even at, so even after, uh, so that there's even an added, the added weight of not even being able to have physical contact with anybody. Oh yes, yes, that's that's. Or oh. or being able to have a conversation without this piece of plexiglass in front of you. Right, right. Or in the general prison right. visiting setting, have a cup of coffee. Right. Sit take down. a picture. Right. Sit down, you know, shake hands, get a hug in. Right. You know, so the lack of contact also over the years is also a, a deprivation issue. You know, when you don't get to contact people, you don't get to hug people, you don't get to, you know, and then there's the lights and then there's the air conditioning. Nowadays, you know, prisons are built also technically to be able to torture you in those ways. You know, too much light, not enough light. You know, uh, too much cold, not enough heat. Too much heat. Uh, you know, a little tiny pencil this big. You know, a comb this big. Uh, toothbrush that big. You know, because they can do it. And because they'll tell you, oh, well, we can't spend a whole bunch of money on toothbrushes, so that's why it's that big. Or pencils. Or whatever it may be. Everything's that big. But it's also psychological at the same time. You know. So, you've put in all this work to try and help you get your dad out. You're not alone. You know, other people have been along for the ride and done what they can do. What, what can other people do to help you get your dad out? Um, they can definitely support the family. They can definitely support him, write him, um, join his campaign. Google, go to his website, you know, russellmaroonshokes.com. Uh, but more importantly, an interesting thing that is developing and happening that's kind of uh, coming as a kind of shock, as out of left field, as 
kind of not historically connected is the issues around the planet and the eco issues and even eco activists um, turning some of their attention from being permafrost activists and animal activists to being more coalition activists and asking people like my father to join on to their struggle and vice versa and them joining on to his struggle. So there's um, an interconnectedness that's happening. There's an interconnectedness that's happening that's being forced actually just by the times and just by the not just urgency now around my dad's case but the urgency around just life in general and the overlap of that urgency just around life where you know, a lot of people in the movement, you know, have said, you know, well, it's been urgent all the time, you know, to try to get these people out, you know. But some of those people also are saying, hey, you know, I've been in this movement for years, you know, and we haven't really been balanced in the context of... Uh, making these connections? Not just making these connections, but... Between struggles... Sure, sure, between struggles, but also just realizing that uh, there's a real sense of urgency on the planet now, you know, uh, with the Arab Spring or whatever it may be, Occupy stuff, whatever. But there are also a contingents of people who are stepping outside of their comfort zone you know, to, to, to possibly deal with some issues. And in and, and my father's context, too, stepping outside of his comfort zone to deal with people who historically may not have dealt with him. Historically, he may not have uh, uh, seen their issues. But now seeing and understanding uh, vice versa importance of, uh, of their separate struggles. But even, I think, more importantly... So, so do you think that these are just kind of sort of like you know, the Native Americans describe the world as, as you know, strands on a web. You, you think that these strands are finally recognizing that they're a web? Yes. I don't think they're recognizing it per se. I think they're just forced into it. You know, there's a sense of... They're forced to travel down that the route. rest of that line to find out that it's connected to something else. Sure, sure. And I don't think that my dad's devoid of that. I don't think I'm devoid of that. You know, it's a real thing that people have gotten away from growing food. It's a real thing that Monsanto's will grow it for you. And it's a real thing that you might grow an arm out your neck. Like, that's a real thing. It's a real thing. And I don't want to think about it in some crazy conspiracy. You know, I'm not an animal rights activist. You know, I'm not, you know, Mr. Super Green, you know, but I am changing my ways, you know, in reference to everything from what I'm eating and putting in my body to recycling. You know, not that I think that recycling is the end all be all, you know, but I don't think that landfills are make any sense at all, actually, at the end of the day. And that's what the people do with my trash, per se. Um, and so I'm thinking about all of those things in a different type of way. Um, and I, as, as a result, so you, so as a result of this sort of, um, uh, call it an awareness between these different struggles, you feel that, uh, sort of like all, all the boats are rising in, in the bay, so to speak. All of the boats are definitely rising in the bay. But I must say this, um, that there have been people, indigenous people, uh, 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 quote unquote hippie people, quote unquote, not even quote unquote, move, you know, and move, they're not hippie people to me, but I feel as though their involvement with Mumia, so forth and so on, um, has really skewed what people actually visualize and understand about MOVE. But nothing, and when I say nothing, 
when I say absolutely nothing, that people think about the permafrost movement, the, the animal rights movement, or anything like that is remotely even close to new to move. Yeah, they think outside of the box, and that might scare you. And yeah, they're a little unconventional, and that might scare you. But they were attacking the zoo 20 years ago. <laughs> let them out. <laughs> let, let them out. They're walking around like this. That's the animals. They're walking around like this. The animal just pacing back and forth like this. And that's inhumane at some point. Prisoners do that same pace back and forth. It's funny you talking about the zoos because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a prison. It's a prison for you to get your rocks off and come see some animals. And see some animals. It's a weird kind of get up, you know, but that's what it is at the end of the day. And I don't need to see animals like that. I don't, I've never enjoyed seeing animals like that, even as a kid. I, and so, so now people say, oh, that's important. But that's been important. And they've been saying it was important, but because they didn't wear, they might not wear as many clothes and they might not style their hair the way you style your hair. And, and Pam might say motherfucker 20 times, you might be uncomfortable with that. But nevertheless, I, you know, they've been saying that already. What you saying already, they've been said, they've been said that a long, long time ago. That's what got them into trouble initially. Yeah, Move was the house that was, or they were the organization or community that was. That was bombed. They, they were only community in the history of the United States that the United States has, has bombed. They bombed their own citizens. They, they, they committed war and atrocities on citizens. I mean, unarmed children. About permafrost issues, about animal issues, about this is what we're talking about. Right. We're not talking about, we're not talking about, yes, move armed themselves in some small part of their history. You know, you can see them with arms. But MOVE is a life organization. They, they, they ain't about that. They're not really. They're not they're the not militant. Either. Right. They're not. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't have the strategy that the BLA had. They weren't doing military actions, per se. They were defending themselves with those guns. That was after they had been attacked, you know, and attacked and attacked and attacked. And then it was like, well, we can't. We, we got to do something, you know. In the but, same way, in the same way that your father was defending his community. Sure, sure, sure. Does your dad think that he's ever going to get out? I or think do you my think dad. Think that your dad is going to get out? I think my dad is always thinking he's going to get out. Um, so on top of all this, he's still hopeful. Yeah, yeah. In, you know, in in an otherwise. He, he's under these inhumane conditions and yet he still manages to hold on to hope, which is, you know, as human as it gets. It's as human as it gets. And it's interesting because he meets and organizes and talks with tons of prisoners. And that's, and that's being in solitary. That means that hour in a dog cage outside may be him screaming across to such and such, or that might be a kite note to somebody on a string, or that may just be a hundred letters per month from people out in the street or other prisoners or people segueing or whatever it may be. But he keeps a high level of contact with people. You know, if you begin to write them today, you're going to stop writing first. You're going to stop being a pen pal first. <laughs> You know, so, and, and I'm I, talking about over 20 years, certain people just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Back so and forth. There's volumes. There, there would be volumes of these conversations. Well, I have volumes of letters. Just at some point, I'm going to publish the letters between Russell and Russell the third, because it's just literally volumes wow. of different issues around everything you could think of in my life. From, oh, I'm about to have a kid, oh, this is what you need to do, blah, 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 I'm so happy, blah, 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 whatever it may be. 
Oh, you read this book? Oh, you see that? What's the Spike Lee movie about Malcolm X? How was that? Blah, blah, blah. Whatever it may be. Whatever it may be. Oh, did you read this? Did you see that? What's going on in the streets? Oh, they tore 52nd Street down. Oh, they building it back up because all of these things happen, you know. Um, one of the things that was interesting, uh, uh, one of his comrades had been in as long as he had been in, got out from prison and was totally shocked by a moving seatbelt that just moves across you without you, know, mm -hmm. without you doing anything, you know. So those type of right it situations, is, it, yeah, the, the things that we sort of take for, for granted. granted that you know after X amount of years, you know, because they're it's almost like they're locked in a time capsule. Sure, sure. He's and they come out, and all of a sudden it's like they're on another planet, a, a total new planet, and things have changed. You know, yeah, it's still the same block. But now they tore that building down, and now it's condos there. Well, yeah, there used to be projects. Right. But now white people live in it, and they cost, you know, X, Y, Z, and they're, and they're upscale. You know. Do you think your dad will get out? I do believe my dad will get out. Uh, interesting enough, uh, with all of the work that I've put in <laughs> over X amount of years, um, to not see him out at this moment right here, right now, is trying you know, at different given points, because I feel like, I feel like the work that I put in was quality work. And I feel like the work that I put in was substantial. You know, it wasn't like Whistling Dixie and it wasn't easy work and it wasn't sloppy work and it wasn't just ho-hum work, you know? Um, so with all of that said, um, I'm not discouraged at all, but at the same time, I can see how other people have become discouraged or uh, people have fallen by the wayside in, in, in reference to uh, his campaign.